Here's our agenda today. We're going to start off actually talking a bit about uh, internal funding versus external funding and those opportunities uh, so you understand the difference. Uh, there are some reporting requirements with the Dotson uh, for external funding, and so we're going to make sure we define those for you all at the start so we know what that's a bit about. Uh, then we're going to dive right in. We're going to talk about the Dotson Research Grant uh, and give you a space to then ask any questions you have about that. So we have a lot of clarity around the process and the grant and its purpose. Uh, and then we're going to shift gears. and We're going to talk about the travel grant uh, and then overview that and then give you a space to ask questions about that. Um, and so we actually have two grants and sometimes folks will refer to them uh, in the same breath or assume they're related. They'll send me a question, ask about the dots and travel grant. Um, they're actually two very different grants. Um, the dots and research grant focuses on research and comes from an endowment and the travel grant comes from graduate school internal funds. Uh, and so hopefully we can also uh, disentangle those a bit today because uh, they serve two different purposes. So first up, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about internal funding versus external funding, okay? Um, and so our internal funding, uh, we refer to that, that is any fellowship, uh, research, teaching assistance, sti uh, teaching assistantship, stipends, grants, tuition assistance, anything funded by your university. Uh, if you are currently serving as an RA or a TA, uh, at the doctoral level and you receive the doctoral tuition remission, that is internal funding. Uh, if you uh, are serving at a different level, but you have that TA position and it has that monthly stipend, that's also part of your internal funding. Uh, if you receive a scholarship from your program because you're uh, doing well academically um, or you submitted a project that got funded or something like that from your program, that is internal funding. Anything that's coming from your school or from the university directly uh, or from uh, funding from your PI is gonna be internal funding. Um, if you uh, receive an offer of admission uh, from your PhD program and they tell you, yep, we're gonna give you a half-time teaching assistant position, as I mentioned, that has a tuition benefit, those are all internal funding mechanisms. Um, internal funding uh, can cover some or all of the cost of attendance. Uh, it also may cover some basic living expenses, depending on your situation. Again, if you look at doctoral tuition remission, that's covering either a portion or all of your tuition. Uh, and then the monthly step in you receive for the work that you do helps offset your basic living expenses. And so that is internal funding. Um, and so that is when we talk about internal funding and we talk about our grants, um, that's what we're referring to directly. External funding, and if you see in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, there's a little QR code there. If you want to go directly to and check out our external funding page, we have a lot of resources for seeking this. Um, you can kind of link to that directly right now if you'd like. Um, but that is any fellowship, scholarship, research grant, or other fund uh, that is given by an organization outside of your university. Uh, so examples of that would be like the NSF GRFP, uh, which uh, we just recently moved through a process and kind of trying to encourage folks to apply for that. Rhodes Scholarships, um, Fulbright, uh, U.S. Student Program, um, all of those would be external funding, right? Um, smaller uh, scholarships and, and grants also could be uh, considered or would be considered external funding. So uh, we have folks sometimes apply for uh, you know, a thousand dollar scholarship through uh, the a national organization for, you know, science. Um, trying to remember the specific one we've recently seen where students were in, um, were in like the natural sciences and through a conference they attended, they had an opportunity to apply for kind of a smaller grant that uh, focused on their research um, that they were awarded. And so that's an example of uh, external funding, right? And so they can be large, uh, Funding opportunities like the NSF GRP, they could be smaller ones, uh, you know, $500, $1,000, a one-time scholarship. Uh, they could be things that fund you for multiple years. So maybe you receive a $1,000 scholarship that over, so, uh, is over four years. Um, those are all examples of potential external funding opportunities. Um, they can pay partial to full tuition, depending on um, how lucrative the opportunity is in external funding. Um, they sometimes can pay living expenses and or help fund your complete and complete your research project. Um, there are some external funding opportunities that will essentially pay for everything. Um, they're very competitive, they're very prestigious, but there are some that uh, will pay for not only that tuition, uh, but also give you a healthy living stipend um, and pay for health insurance and things like that. Um, 
I will try to do as much as I can to notify you about those types of uh, funding opportunities when the graduate school becomes aware of them. You often see when we have our five things uh, bulletin that we send out every other week to students, uh, I always try to include something funding related in that. Um, and so usually there's something in there that uh, will be in the external funding category. Um, we had two uh, potential external funding type uh, categories in there uh, this last time that we sent out yesterday. And so uh, sometimes they're big ticket ones and sometimes they're smaller. And so I think this most recent one, we had a Laura Bassey um, scholarship really helps uh, essentially cover the cost of publishing. Um, and so that is uh, $2,500 for doctoral students, $750 for master's students. It's really about helping like publish research. Uh, and so it's a very specific external funding source. And then we had some uh, that was uh, the RAND Corporation summer uh, um, assistantship programs that's really looking at asking you to come in and do research and then pay you for that, uh, a fairly healthy amount for that. So those are examples of external funding. And differentiating that's very important and we'll kind of see why as we talk about the Dotson Research Grant because there is again a reporting requirement and expectation that you apply for external funding. And again, as we go through, if you have any questions, if I'm not being as clear as I could be on something, feel free to drop that in the chat or come off mute, raise your hand, however you want to do that. I'll be sure to answer those questions and make sure you get what you need in the conversation. So I linked to and showed you the external funding uh, page uh, in the last slide. Um, the internal funding page, which is where we actually store the grant guidelines and application for both the dots and research grant and the travel grant. Um, I also wanna make sure I uh, let you know where that's at so you can actually submit these applications. And so if you go to our webpage uh, and then you click on funding on the dropdown, you'll have these options here, paying for graduate school, doctoral tuition remission, internal funding, external funding, and then a link that talks more about CONACYT uh, and funding for Mexican national students. Um, and so if you click on the internal funding uh, drop down, that will take you to the page that talks about uh, and gives the application for the Dotson Research Grant and the Travel Grant. If you want to navigate there directly, there's a QR code there in the bottom right hand of the screen and also a link to that. So if you don't have a QR code ability, you can't scan that right now, you want to type it in. It's pretty easy. UTIP.edu backslash graduate backslash funding, uh, and that will take you to the pages. Um, and so make sure you know where you can find that uh, because attending the info session, getting all the good info and being ready to apply isn't helpful if you don't know where to apply. And so first step, lo locate the funding in the guidelines so you can go through it. Once you locate that, uh, we can actually start digging into what are the grants that we have. And so there are two that we offer. Uh, there is the Dotson Research Grant and the Travel Grant. And so we're gonna talk first about Dotson. Um, that is a research grant that is open to students in all fields of study. Um, it is not limited to just STEM students or just students in the humanities. Um, it's open to everyone. Uh, and we have students from all programs receiving that grant. Um, and so it's not necessarily concentrated in one area, although sometimes we do see spikes in uh, certain programs submitting more applications on a given year and therefore uh, winning a few more than other programs. And I think that just comes down to awareness of the students and not necessarily uh, the research that's being conducted. Uh, it is funded by the Les and Harriet Dodson Endowment, uh, which is an endowment that is overseen by the president's office at UTEP. And so essentially Les and Harriet left money to the institution that is to fund student success. And uh, every year, um, every uh, department is able to essentially submit a proposal requesting funding from the president's office from this endowment to fund student success initiatives. Um, this year, there's about $1.5 million uh, in requests submitted to the president's office and about $475,000 of funding from the endowment was given to programs uh, or to departments uh, based on those proposals. Uh, I am happy to share that $100,000 of that $475,000 allotment went to the graduate school um, because we have uh, worked very hard over the years with our Dotson Research Grant to demonstrate uh, our positive student outcomes and how it helps students move through uh, their program, reach graduation, publish papers, um, seek external funding. Uh, and so we've shown that this positively impacts students. And so we get a good chunk of uh, funding to then distribute to folks. And so we're excited to be able to do that. Um, we award students about up to $3,000 uh, through the Dodson Research Grant. Uh, it primarily assists students who are actively working on dissertations or theses or in a final project. Um, 
it's not necessarily that we preference that, it's just that students that are at that stage are typically able to field the most competitive application as their research is the most developed. Um, but we will consider essentially uh, any other project that is submitted. And so if you're not yet at that phase, but you're needing money for research, you can still apply, you can still be successful. Um, I would say on balance, doctoral students tend to be a bit more competitive in the process than master students. Um, we don't have a criteria that elevates them more. And so if you're a master's student, please don't feel like you can't apply or you can't be competitive. Um, you definitely can. And we have master's students win every year. Um, my anecdotal uh, uh, thought on this is that our doctoral students are just a little bit more ready and polished in their proposals. And so they're able to edge out our master's students sometimes. Um, and so if you're a master's student, uh, what I want you to take from that is just make sure you work really hard on the polish piece and uh, submitting a great application because you can still be received the funding. You can pass up those doctoral students by just uh, making sure you're on the ball and demonstrating your research really well. Uh, and you can definitely receive the grant, um, but it is open to everyone. Um, we do consider it an excellent professional development opportunity as well uh, so for you to gain some experience in grant writing. And so if you've never submitted a grant application, uh, starting with the Dodson is a great place to do that. Uh, it's a safe space. Uh, it's within the institution. We do provide feedback on all applications. Uh, we have a, a faculty review committee that basically uh, determines the scoring and helps us determine who we fund. And we ask the reviewers to provide feedback on the application. As long as they do that, we press it on to you as the applicant. Um, whether you receive the grant or not, we sell you the feedback and so that you can improve that in the future. Uh, and that is a great professional development tool. Uh, you won't always receive uh, constructive feedback on your grant proposal. So to get that directly from faculty here, to be able to put that into practice is really useful for when you submit big time grants, right? So you decide you're gonna apply for the NSF or uh, something like that. So um, it's great to help develop that professional lens of grant writing. And so I encourage folks to apply. Um, so that is kind of uh, what the grant is and who it funds. Some examples of folks that have received the Dotson Research Grant, uh, and they come from all areas and all programs. And so we've had folks who are uh, master students in engineering uh, who've used the funds uh, to develop a water filtration system for underdeveloped communities. Um, We've had folks uh, who are in the doctoral level of Borderlands history in the College of Liberal Arts use the funding to travel within the state and internationally uh, to access archival data on binational water use, uh, which is an interesting project. And so again, important thing there is noting that it covered travel that was for research purposes, both within the state and internationally. Um, we've had a doctoral students in ecology and evolutionary biology in the College of Science use the funding to support travel to Africa to collect samples of a rare chameleon. Uh, they gauged the impact of climate change. Um, and we've had a uh, doctoral student in, in the international uh, business area for College of Business use it to purchase incentives for, to recruit participants into a research project, right? Uh, so wide range of topics and research can be covered. Uh, through this grant. And $3,000 is not a huge amount of money for uh, a grant, but it is a very good amount of money to cover and offset research expenditures uh, when you're looking at a thesis or a dissertation. A lot of times that can cover the bulk of what you're looking to cover to make sure you're getting your research done. Some guidelines on what we can and can't fund though, and I ask folks to be very uh, intentional about reviewing this um, because requesting things that you cannot uh, be funded for essentially will put you out of contention. And so you need to make sure you construct your budget and request very carefully. Um, but things that we can fund for you, um, if you are a recipient of the grant, it can cover the travel for field research. Um, we had actually had a question about this. And if you uh, saw the application call very early, um, and we'll talk about some changes in the Dodson grant here a little bit later, um, but there were some changes where it wasn't quite clear whether or not the Dodson could be used for travel. And so we had to clarify that with the president's office. Uh, once we received our allotment, we have received confirmation that yes, it can be used for research related travel. Um, it is used a lot for usable lab materials. Um, 
It is used for tests that you may request. Um, you see sometimes where they have, so folks have to send samples out to a different laboratory to run a different screen or a test or something to get results back. It's something we don't have the capacity or the ability to do within our, our uh, home confines. So we cover that. Um, it can cover participant incentives. Um, those need to be um, justifiable uh, and pass through IRB and not be uh, coercive. And so if you watch the IRB sessions, they kind of talk about why that is. Um, but yep, we can cover your participant incentives. Um, and it can cover equipment that is less than $300 or essentially 10% of a total maximum grant. Um, this is something we instituted uh, about two years ago as a guideline. It had has always been that the Dotson Research Grant could not fund uh, equipment. Um, durable items that could stay at the institution for multiple years uh, were not generally allowable under the grant. Um, again, unless a student could really strongly justify the need for that purchase. Um, the example I will I, I use is coming from like the kinesiology area, like we cannot buy you a weight bench uh, for your research lab. That's not the purpose of the grant. Uh, if your research lab needs a weight bench, your PI should be working uh, with ORSP to submit the request to purchase that. Um, but if you need the uh, testing diodes and things that are kind of disposable to conduct the testing with the weight bench, we can help cover that cost. Um, we can't purchase you a microscope, right? But we can purchase you the slides and the cells and things like that that go along with it type of thing. Um, we added the uh, equipment less than $300 or 10% to accommodate that sometimes folks that they need something that's a relatively small piece of equipment, it's very specialized. Um, and we allow that purchase, um, but you do need to justify it. Um, and we kind of wrote this around uh, national guidelines that we saw. Uh, and so we mirror that of like that 10% uh, of total grant uh, is kind of mirrors um, government related grants and what they expect. And so that's the, the limit. Things that we cannot cover, and so please do not include in your proposal as a request, because they will again move you out of contention and consideration, uh, is travel to conferences or trainings. Um, the travel grant is for conference travel. The Dodson Research Grant does not cover that. Even if in your proposal you're hoping to uh, travel so you can present your research or use that conference to gather more research, that's not what it covers. And so um, it will not cover that. That's actually one of the things that would be a president's office was very explicit about is that Dotson does not cover uh, conference travel. Um, and so it doesn't cover that or trainings that you may need. Um, and so if you need a specialized training to um, conduct your research, um, that's not something that this would cover. Um, it can not be used to pay assistance. Uh, and so that is also sometimes a challenge. So let's say you need a, a translator uh, while on your research trip, um, we cannot pay the fees for that. Uh, and so uh, we can pay for transcription services, but we can't pay someone a wage. Uh, and so there's a bit of a difference there in what that looks like. So paying for a service versus paying a wage. Um, so it doesn't pay assistance. It doesn't pay folks to work in your lab. It doesn't pay folks to help you collect samples while you're on a research trip. Um, so we've had folks ask that, using the example of a person that uh, was collecting samples for the chameleon, we were able to pay for the travel, but not pay for them to be able to have people uh, collect the samples for them while they were there, right? We can't pay that wage. Uh, it doesn't cover uh, tuition costs. Uh, this is a research grant, not a tuition support, because uh, I mentioned it doesn't cover wages for you either. Um, and so you can't pay yourself with the grant. Uh, and again, any equipment that's more than $300 uh, and, or equating to 10% of a total maximum grant uh, is not allowable under this, uh, this grant. Uh, the caveat, uh, the asterisk with that, the equipment piece is that uh, you can request equipment uh, that we personally use type equipment as long as you can very strongly justify it to the faculty committee saying this is something that I need and then can't be covered elsewhere, right? We will have sometimes folks that will put into the request um, external hard drives uh, because they're working with significant amounts of data and they need a, a large hard drive to be able to store it and they've requested it and it's more than $300. Maybe they need multiple of those. Um, we've had folks request laptops. Um, that they need in order to have a certain set of processing power to do their work. Um, I will be honest, I don't feel like those are the most competitive or compelling applications, but folks have requested those and sometimes been approved. But essentially at that point, you are selling to the faculty committee 
why should I be allowed to um, bend the rules here or get an exemption from this, um, this requirement? And so keep that in mind as you're thinking about your application if you feel like you need to request something that is a bit different than that equipment line. Components of your application. Uh, and so you're going to need to put together a project proposal that is three pages, double spaced. Uh, it should be clear and non-technical in its explanation of the project. Uh, I want you to keep in mind as you are writing it, uh, you're not writing your uh, grant to be read by an expert in your field. Um, the faculty reviewers, uh, you'll have two that review your application, will be folks that are in related uh, programs or colleges, right? And so if you are, let's say, in the DPT program, you will not have somebody in the DPT program or health sciences directly review it. You will have somebody from the College of Science, potentially. Um, and so you want to write it in such a way that you're writing to an educated audience. They are faculty members. Um, but if you are overly complex and you write it to essentially a, a peer or to your PI uh, who really understands your research, they may not fully understand what you're discussing and that's going to hurt you in the review. And so, uh, and this is good practice because when you write a grant, you want to write in clear non-technical language for an educated, um, but not expert audience. And so that's part of the professional development here. Uh, make sure you give a description of activities uh, that you need funding for. Um, make sure you connect it to your degree completion. That's something that's very important that they're going to want to see is how is this going to help you get to that master's degree, that doctoral degree. Um, and then if you have one in the past, you need to notify and kind of include that in your application. And you need to justify why additional funding uh, is warranted here, right? And so if you're a prior winner, congratulations, love to have you come back, um, but make sure you justify why you're applying a second time and why you should be awarded. We have also uh, increased our, the clarity on what is required for the budget and explanation uh, section, which is part of your three pages. Um, and so make sure that you are including a table outlining your proposed purchases. So that's very clear, include a justification for those purchases. Uh, and then make sure you're including an estimated time frame of when you would make those purchases. That estimated time frame is going to be very important because of some of the changes that are happening with how Dotson is funded. Um, and then also indicate any other sources of funding you're going to receive or planning on uh, applying for. Um, the big change that we have had for the Dotson grant this year is that those funds can no longer roll over from one fiscal year to the next. Um, and this is a uh, new guardrail that was in play, put in place by the budget office and the president's office. So it's not necessarily a decision that the graduate school is making. Um, it does make the grant a bit harder to use, but that's okay. We will find ways to make sure it works. Um, but what it means is that you need to be more ready to spend the funding than folks in the past have been because you can no longer request an extension and you no longer have a calendar year to spend it. You have one fiscal year because of when we received the funding, which we received <clears throat> notification of the funding in very early November. Sorry, one second. Excuse me. Since we received the funding in very early November um, and we have to run a process, we essentially will be able to uh, notify the winners and issue the funding in January at the start, basically, of the academic or the uh, spring semester. You must utilize that funding. It must be spent out of the account and spent by July 2024 because the fiscal year ends in August. And so if you do not spend the funds by July 2024, in August, when the next fiscal year starts, they will sweep all of the money back out of the account and it will no longer be accessible. And so in order to, uh, to use this funding and receive it and to have it benefit you, you must be ready to spend it. <clears throat> and so what I'm encouraging folks to do is when you're talking about the estimated time with your purchases, uh, make sure you're reviewing, making a strong plan, working with your PI and figuring out what those purchases will look like and make sure you're ready to conduct uh, and spend the money on the research. Um, if you're applying, assuming that you are going to be able to spend this money, you know, next December or next May or whenever you get around to it, it's not going to work that way. 
In the past, we've had the flexibility to allow for extensions. So folks had something come up, they weren't able to spend the money, they asked for a one semester or one year extension, and we were able to grant it. We can no longer do that. Um, that is a process that is just no longer allowable by the budget office. Um, and in the past, we've given a calendar year, essentially, to use the funding. That's no longer possible because we have to work within a fiscal year confine. Um, so it is a bit of a challenge. Uh, it gives us about a six month window to actually utilize the funding, um, but it is the restriction that we have to work through. And so uh, make sure you're considering that as you're working on your application. Additional things you need to include, uh, make sure you have IRB approval if it is necessary for your project uh, and include that. Um, if you know you will need IRB approval, but you haven't received it yet, uh, make sure you're indicating in your proposal that you're planning uh, to uh, seek IRB approval or let us know where you're at in the process um, because we cannot disperse the funding to you until you receive that approval. Uh, and so if you're like, yep, I've submitted, but I haven't gotten my, my response back yet, or I'm planning to submit you know, at the end of the month or whatever it is, make sure you let us know. And then if you are a recipient, you have to notify us when you actually receive the IRB approval so we can uh, issue you the funds. Make sure that you're giving us a strong indication of your plan to apply for external funding. Uh, it is a requirement that during the time that you are uh, a recipient of the Dotson grant, you also apply for external funding. It is a requirement. And so on the application, you have to indicate to us, these are the things that I may apply for. Um, you could change your mind and apply for something different, um, but it is a requirement that you uh, follow through and you submit some application for external funding. And again, it is external funding. Saying, you know, I received funding that my PI gave me through their grant, um, and so I don't need to do this, will not cover. You must apply for something. Uh, saying you received a scholarship from uh, your college. Um, does not qualify as external funding. Uh, and so make sure you're applying for external funding through this. One of the things that uh, we articulate to the president's office is that the Dodson Research Grant helps us encourage and uh, help students receive external funding. That's part of the reason they continue to give us the large check funding that we do get for Dodson. And so we need to continue on that portion of the grant. It's part of the key components of what we do. Um, and then also include your latest individualized development plan. Uh, those are required for all graduate students. You should already have one on file. I do encourage you to update it and work through it through your mentor because the individualized development plan is a scored section of the application. And so sometimes the difference between someone who receives funding and someone who doesn't is the attention to detail and the feedback from their mentor on their IDP. I have definitely seen folks where it's two very similar proposals in quality, and one person has sat down with their mentor and gotten good feedback and has good goals written out, and someone else has written an individualized development plan that is very much just going through the numbers as a requirement, and that one point difference is what is the difference between who got $3,000 and who didn't, uh, and so make sure you update it, make sure it's good. And then there is a faculty mentor letter of support. We will collect that. And so it's part of your application, but not something you submit. Uh, when you put in your application, we receive the notification. Uh, we will then contact uh, your faculty mentor and say, hey, they for applying for the Dotson. Um, can you please submit a uh, letter of support? And then that is also a scored portion of your application. The overall process of how we review it, um, it is an online application through Question Pro. You'll find the link uh, on our internal funding page under Dodson. Um, yes, Elizabeth, go ahead. Jesse, there's a quick question. Um, yeah. It says, does the IRB of the proposed study need to be under the student's name? Or as it, as it does, the student's name it does not have to be under the student's name as long as you have approval to conduct the research that you're proposing, right? And so if your IRB approval is with your PI, um, then you should be able to apply for it. But just make sure you are writing about your research, right? You're not applying to fund someone else's. Uh, and so as long as you're applying for your research and you're approved to do it, even if the IRB approval is under a different, like I say again, probably under your PI, um, that is acceptable as long as, again, you have approval to conduct the research. Good question. Thank you. 
So uh, applications online, um, we will only be able to have one cycle per year now. As I mentioned, there's been updates to the financial process for this because we have to spend, or the funding has to be spent by July. It's really not possible for us to do a uh, application in spring because that application would open in February or March would close March and April, somewhere in there, then has to be reviewed. And we would probably in May, June, give folks the money and they'd have a month to spend it. The timeline simply no longer works. And so we have one cycle per year. Uh, that means we'll probably actually issue a few more grants it, than we normally do in one cycle. Um, and so we'll fund a few more students, um, but it is only once a year that we can now run this. Um, so we have our one cycle. Uh, this one we are running from November 9th through December 10th. And so you have until the 10th uh, to submit your application. Um, once you submit your application, we collect everything and get all the information ready. Um, we will then provide those to the faculty review committee. You'll have two reviewers, as I mentioned. Um, we'll have them score it. We average your scores, and then we look from there about who we're funding. Uh, once we know who we're funding, we'll send notifications uh, to everyone of your status. Uh, and the folks that are chosen will have to sign a award letter indicating their agreement for the funds and that they'll use them and then send it back to us. Uh, and then we fund uh, the process, uh, and you get to work. Uh, you also need to submit that external funding application somewhere during that time. Uh, when the grant closes, uh, you will submit a closeout report. And we'll talk about that really quickly about what's in that. So in your closeout report, uh, we are looking for you to give us an update on the status of your research. Um, one second here. Mute our person there who just joined. All right. So you will uh, update us on the status of your research. Uh, you will give us an updated timeline on your degree completion or immediate plans post-graduation. If you have uh, graduated, um, you will uh, let us know about any applications, or no, I'm sorry, any applications, any publications that you've submitted uh, that are maybe in progress, submitted or accepted as a result from your research. Um, list any uh, conference presentations that you may have given that's related to the research. Uh, we do ask for one to three pictures of you in action of your research. As we follow along the presentation, you see a lot of students uh, conducting research. Um, those are dots and recipients, and those are the pictures they submit. Um, we ask for those because it helps us tell the story uh, of what y'all are doing for research, and so it helps us with that, and so we ask for those pictures. Uh, we need an itemized statement of how you used your grant. Uh, if you have more than, uh, you know, I believe our, our threshold is $200 left in the grant, we do ask that money be sent back to the graduate school. Um, and so we do need um, uh, an information of how you've actually utilized the grant so we can uh, verify that and audit it. Uh, and then help us understand how those funds contributed to your academic progress and your professional goals. Uh, and so that's the closeout report that you would submit uh, in August, essentially, July, August. This is uh, the actual rubric that we use, uh, that we give to the faculty review committee. Um, and so it works on a uh, five point scale for most of them. And then a few of them are a little bit smaller. So letter of support and external funding plan are still scored, but a little less. Um, but we have a rubric that we use and we ask them to evaluate your overall uh, success in your proposal. And so this is an example of what we use. I will say that we are gonna be modifying this a bit to account for the timeline uh, concerns. And so know that we will adjust this a bit, um, but not significantly and we'll mostly focus on the budget section. And then some tips and tricks to help you be successful. Uh, first, make sure you attend an info session, already done. You're already well ahead of the game. Um, Make sure you seek feedback uh, on your draft essays from your professors, your mentors, and research advisors. Get folks to take a look at it. Um, I encourage folks to take their time submitting. There is no advantage to submitting early. Um, we'd love to get them. It makes me feel less nervous when I have some coming in, um, but I know that the bulk of the submissions will come in on the last day, and that's okay. Uh, that means students are using their full time to make sure they're putting together quality applications. So use that time, talk to your folks, get uh, your feedback. Um, go make an appointment with the Writing Center. Uh, we did the mechanics of graduate writing yesterday with Dr. Lou Herman, the uh, director of the Writing Center. He did a great job uh, going through some, some basics of uh, writing. Um, so go over there and use those resources as well 
to help with your pre-writing, your brainstorming, your structure, make sure things are, are well uh, written well. It's also a great place to look at and have a conversation about, is this written in a non-technical clear way? Because you're not necessarily going to meet with someone who's an expert in your field when you go to the writing center. So they're going to be able to tell you like, hey, yeah, I can understand what you're trying to tell us here um, versus this is too technical. And so that's a great resource uh, specifically for getting at that level. And then make sure your style is, uh, your style is written correctly. Um, make sure you revise, revise, revise. If you submit it with a bunch of typos or you forget to put a title on it, um, the fact that the reviewers are going to take notice and that's going to impact uh, your overall score. Um, if it's not a polished product, um, they're going to score it lower. You probably won't receive the funding. Uh, and so make sure you do that. So you have a question here. Are we allowed to see the faculty mentor letter of support before they submit it? That is be entirely between you and your faculty mentor. If they want to show it to you and they feel comfortable with that, um, that is up to you or up to them. Um, all we ask is they submit it and they submit it directly to us. Some folks will be comfortable with that. Some folks won't. Um, and, and we really don't get in the middle of that, if that makes sense. Uh, and then make sure you give your uh, faculty mentor plenty of time and materials they need to write you a strong letter of support. Um, it doesn't happen very often, but we uh, every once in a while we have a faculty mentor that lets us know, I didn't know the student was applying for the Dotson Research Grant, uh, or I don't feel like I can actually uh, submit this letter of support because I don't know enough about their research. Um, and so please make sure you're talking with them, letting them know you're applying. Um, and if they ask questions, they, they can uh, articulate uh, your research well, uh, your uh, commitment well. And so make sure they know about it. So that is the Dotson. Uh, we do spend most of our session on the Dotson because it's a bit more complex. I want to take pause here and answer any questions we might have, and then we'll move through the travel grant. It moves a bit quicker because it's not as complex a grant. Any questions? Going once, going twice. What I'm gonna quickly drop into the chat, if you're thinking about it, you're not sure what questions you might have, um, we have an email specifically for the Dodson at the graduate school that we use for collecting applications and answering questions. It is dodsongrad at utep.edu. And so if you think, a question, think of a question later, or maybe you don't wanna ask the question in an open meeting, send me that question and I will get you an answer. Uh, question here, the total equipment cost can go over $300. Yes, so if you have multiple pieces of equipment, um, but as long as each one is under $300, you can uh, expense that. Um, if it's the same item over and over again, then it's kind of treated as one piece of equipment. So the example I will use is the uh, hard drives example, where someone uh, requested essentially like nine hard drives, um, and they try to break them up and say, oh, it's, you know, each one's $100. Well, it's actually kind of a bulk purchase. And so it's like one purchase, even though it's multiple items. And so that uh, had needed a really strong justification. But let's say you need a hard drive that, you know, or something like that, and then you need a different piece of equipment and then you need this piece of equipment, um, those can work. Good question, by the way, thank you. If you have more questions, put them into the chat, send them to Dotson grad, we'll happen to answer them for you. Um, I am gonna move on to the travel grant so we get through that one as well. Um, but again, if you also think about it, I'll be here. We've got uh, time for questions at the end too. I'll make sure I make time for that. Um, I can answer those for you as well. So the travel grant, a bit different. Uh, it is a professional development grant facilitated by the graduate school. Uh, so I'm ask very quickly, uh, can we get a recording of the meeting? You sure can. I'm recording it. I will uh, actually post that to our website um, probably by middle of next week uh, so that you all can see that. And so um, just be on the lookout for that on our website. If you send an email to dotsongrad at utep.edu specifically asking for the recording, I will send you the link directly. Otherwise, we post it to our website. So send me an email if you want it. Um, so travel grant, that is a professional development grant facilitated by the graduate school. Um, it is funded by the graduate school, not by a, an endowment. And so we do have more control over the funds there. Uh, it is designed to assist with the cost of travel to academic conferences, professional organization meetings, or specialized professional development opportunities. And so it's got some flexibility there. Um, you can apply for something that's virtual or something that is uh, in person. Uh, both are acceptable. Uh, and we will fund the selected applications up to $850 uh, towards their uh, expenses related to this. Um, 
it doesn't always have to be 850. And so let's say you just need a hundred bucks to cover the cost of attending a virtual conference, apply for that and we may fund it. Um, and so there's no benefit necessarily to asking for the maximum amount versus a smaller amount, um, but the maximum is 850. Um, something that is very important about the travel grant is that you need to be very conscious of the guidelines and what you ask for when you submit your grant. Um, you can only request things that are fundable through reimbursement from the grant. Um, and if you request something that is non-fundable, we automatically disqualify your application. We won't even review it, to be honest with you. Um, we receive a very high volume of travel grants. Uh, and so when we're out of fairness, we only review things that we can actually fund. Um, and we've stated that very clearly in the grant guidelines. So things that we can fund are conference registrations, ground transportation. So it's like Uber, bus, train, things like that hotel costs, um, all of those things with a travel authorization and receipts. Uh, and if you need to know more about the travel process, uh, there's a QR code right there. It'll take you to the student travel website. Those are all things that we can fund and will fund. Uh, and it all happens through reimbursement. We cannot issue you the funding in advance. And so uh, if you need money to cover the cost of conference registration, uh, you will need to pay that and then request the uh, reimbursement. Things that we cannot and will not fund through the travel grant is the cost of professional memberships. And so this sometimes happens where folks are saying, you know, in order to attend the conference as a student, I have to be a member. It costs 50 bucks for the membership, but then the conference costs $200 less. Uh, and so they think that they're being budget conscious and helping sell a little bit better by saying, hey, can I have the $50 for this? And then this amount of money to cover the cost. And the answer is actually, we can't do that. We can't cover the cost of your professional membership. Um, we would rather you actually ask for just the non-member amount um, and uh, get the reimbursement on that because we can't cover your professional memberships. Um, you may be able to articulate to us and have a more competitive uh, application by saying, hey, I am a member because I paid this amount and that means my cost is less. That will actually pay dividends in your budget section and, and help you be more competitive in a very competitive grant pool. Um, but please don't ask for us to cover your professional memberships. Um, we can't cover any supplies or equipment needed to attend or participate in the conference. We've had folks who are attending virtually in the past that have asked for like a special webcam or microphone. Um, we cannot cover those. Uh, and so those requests will get you screened out. Um, we don't cover any per, per diem. And so daily costs and meals, that's what per diem stands for. Um, and so please don't request costs for per diem in the travel grant. Uh, we will not cover those. And then the big one and the one that's probably most confusing is airfare expenses. Um, we cannot cover the cost of airfare with the travel grant. The reason is that um, airfare uh, for the university has to be booked through the university travel agent. And the university travel agent will not book you flights unless you have a cost center, which means you already have to be funded and it's not done through reimbursement. And so if you schedule and make your own travel plans through Delta and you pre-purchase those things, um, the university won't reimburse it. And the travel grant only functions the reimbursement. So we can't cover airfare. Um, the travel grant essentially is not necessarily to cover the cost of travel. It's to help assist with the wraparound cost to enable you to do this travel. Um, and so that is, is how that works. Um, that's probably the biggest uh, point of confusion or contention we have from students. Uh, we know that airfare is often one of the larger expenses, uh, but the travel grant is here to help support the other additional expenses you would have that come along with uh, a travel or a big conference that you would attend. So again, travel grant, much like uh, Dodson is open to everyone in the graduate school. Um, all master's students, doctoral students can apply. Um, and we have a lot of different students that uh, win for different reasons. And so some examples of successful proposals, um, we have, oh, um, just so you all know, I know that Elizabeth posted the recording of the session uh, there. Um, if we do have a Dotson uh, in info session, I think I may have taken it down, but if we have a Dotson and uh, travel info session from last year, I encourage you to hold on till we update it uh, because it won't do the, include the information about the changes to the funding process uh, and how you can spend the money just to make sure that we're, we're clear on that. So examples of people that have won, uh, you know, master student in kinesiology received funding to attend the Virtual American Diabetes Association Conference and present their research. 
uh, doctoral student in business administration rec uh, requested funds to cover costs uh, associated with going to the Archer Graduate Fellowship in Washington, D.C. during the summer. Uh, they mostly got assistance with covering essentially the train costs, uh, commuting back and forth to their internship site. Um, Another student is in PhD program uh, in computational science, requested funding to cover registration costs associated with attending the American Chemical Society uh, meeting where they presented their poster. Now, a key element that I think is important is that your proposal is much more likely to be successful if you are presenting your research or presenting in some way at the conference. If you are an attendee only, you can still receive the funding, but your application will be less competitive. Uh, and so if you uh, are thinking about applying and you haven't uh, submitted your research to present at the conference yet, I strongly encourage you to do that. So things you'll need to put into your application. It is a two page proposal that is double spaced, uh, 12 point uh, font, one inch margins, make sure you adhere to that. Um, and then you need to include the following. Uh, so make sure you have a non-technical description of what you plan to do on the trip, um, who's hosting it, uh, what the activities are, are you presenting, how does your participation impact UTEP's reputation, all those good things. Again, make sure it's non-technical. Um, please keep in mind that the reviewers of the travel grant are graduate student or graduate school staff. So I'm a reviewer. Uh, I'm not the only one, but I review it. And so you want to make sure that I understand uh, what you're doing, right? And so if you're in a highly technical uh, field, going to a highly technical conference, um, you know, I'm an educated person, but I'm not an expert in your field. So make sure I'm able to understand what you're doing. Um, an explanation of how this activity contributes to completion of your degree. Again, it's very important for us that any funding we give helps advance you towards that degree. Uh, so make that connection clear for us. Outline your future career goals and articulate how the professional development activity will help advance those goals or discuss what skills you're going to refine by participating. Um, again, we're not just sending you to the conference just to go. We want to know that it's going to have uh, an impact on your future uh, and tell us a story. Uh, if we're picking someone we're funding, we're going to want to know what their goals are uh, and how we're going to help them. You do need a simple itemized budget. Um, I encourage you to use an Excel table with an explanatory paragraph that specifies what costs you're asking for us to fund. Um, and that is part of your two pages. And so uh, I encourage you to use an Excel table with just that paragraph after. Um, you can, and folks that do this probably write a better budget, you can outline for me in that uh, Excel sheet all of the expenses that you're expecting to incur for the, the, the conference. You can put in there, it's gonna cost this much for airfare, uh, this much on meals, this much for conference registration, this much for hotel, these are my estimates. But then make sure you very clearly delineate maybe in a total expenses and then a the column says requested expenses, what you're asking for us to fund. Um, it's actually helpful for us to know the full picture of your cost, but then articulate this is what I'm asking for you to pay for. Um, if you ask for more than the 850, you're automatically gonna get removed from the process. Uh, if you ask for something that we can't fund, we're automatically gonna remove from the process. There's too many for us to review to review folks that don't adhere to the guidelines. And so make sure you're really clear on that. Every time we run this grant, we have folks that submit a grant where they ask for $3,000 or $1,500 and hoping we'll give them some money out of it saying, hey, I need 1500 bucks for this, what can you give me? And the answer is nothing. Um, because you didn't adhere to the guidelines. So please make sure you read those very carefully. And then include that IDP. Um, that is not included in the page count. That's uh, gets uh, included along with it. Um, but much like the uh, Dotson grant, we do score the IDP. And sometimes the difference between being accepted and receiving the funding and not is the quality of the individualized development plan. So spend your time on that. <laughs> make sure it's done well. Here is the rubric that we use. Again, we write, we evaluate you on proposal content, writing clarity, your budget, your IDP, and then we do a, a, a point there indicating whether you have previously presented, uh, and then we will review those. Um, because of the volume, we are not able to provide feedback the way we are with the Dodson, uh, and so we apologize for that, but unfortunately we can't provide direct feedback with every, for everybody. But if you have questions about your application after the fact, you can always send an appointment to talk with us about it. Uh, overall process, you're going to submit an online application through Question Pro. It's again, it's on that internal funding page. Uh, there is a uh, cycle in fall and one in spring, and so there's an opportunity to apply in spring as well. Um, students can apply for reimbursement for anything they've recently done. Uh, and so let's say you are going to a conference 
uh, tomorrow. I actually received an email from a student saying, hey, they wanted to come to the info session, but they would be traveling to their conference. Um, I told them we'll send them a recording. Um, and so you're traveling right now. Uh, and so you can write your grant application from the lens of already completing it. You can submit that application for something that you've recently done. Um, I ask you not submit a grant for something you did, you know, two semesters ago. Um, but if it was, you know, in the fall earlier or even in the summer, you can submit an application for that. <clears throat> uh, same thing for spring. You can submit, you know, let's say you are doing something over the winter holiday and you want to apply in spring for reimbursement. You can do that. Uh, it then goes to a committee within the graduate school that reviews it. Uh, once we review and make a decision, we will notify everyone who receives the award of their status. Uh, and then we ask you to complete the student travel process prior to making any travel arrangements. Uh, again, we'll have sometimes folks that um, will not complete those travel uh, processes. And then the budget department will not provide the reimbursement to you because you don't have the proper receipts and you didn't commit the submit the process. So make sure you follow student travel. Um, and then coordinate with your program uh, as Department of Administrative Assistant for distribution or reimbursement of the funds. And so they help us make sure you get the money. So that is travel. As I said, it moves a bit quicker. It's less complex. Um, but now here's where I'll answer any questions about travel or if you thought of one about Dodson, please feel free to ask. Any questions? Anything we're percolating on? Hi, um, can you hear me? I sure can, go ahead. My pro I'm in mental health counseling and my program does not require uh, IDPs. Do you all have IDP sessions? We do, um, that's a great question. So on the um, internal funding webpage, there is some information about IDPs and a link to uh, our template. And so you can download the template there and complete it. And then on our workshops and events page, um, we have a recording of our IDP sessions of how to fill one out, how to set goals and how to seek and get good quality feedback. Um, and so that is something we also do as a professional development session I've recorded and put out there. Um, and so if your program is, is currently not requiring it, are you at the master's level? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, because all doctoral students are required to submit them um, now. Uh, so master's programs, it's hit and miss. Um, but they are good documents that help move folks towards uh, degrees. And so even if you're a master's student, it's still productive. Um, but yeah, uh, we have some guidance out there on our, our uh, page and then a link to the preferred form. Thank you. Absolutely. If you have any questions about that, um, the other uh, uh, email for that is grad gravel at UTEP. That is our email where we um, are spot, collect applications to find questions about the travel grant. And so if you got questions about this one, you can always email me there. Um, you can also email me directly for stuff because uh, nine times out of 10, uh, it's me responding anyway on those shared emails. Um, and so any of those things will work for me if you need to get a hold of me for this or anything else. Any other questions out there? And we fin even with two grants, I tell you, we finished on time. We did good. Uh, well, I appreciate your time. I'll hang around for a little bit uh, in case folks have questions, but they don't want to ask in front of the, the large group. I'll hang around uh, until everybody uh, exits the digital space. Um, but I really appreciate y'all's time and attention today. I'm looking forward to y'all submitting your applications and enjoy your Thursday. <laughs>